No doubt you will remember Dan Lloyd's incredible transformation last winter from middle-aged, beer-drinking, part-time cyclist to middle-aged, beer-drinking, part-time cyclist who was actually pretty darn fit. On just four hours riding per week for 10 weeks, he saw a 15% improvement in three out of the four power dimensions. And his training was planned and carried out using the Sufferfest, which is actually the training platform that introduced us to the concept of four-dimensional power in the first place. A concept which was created by its chief science officer and coach to the stars, Neil Henderson. He is based right here in Boulder, Colorado, home to the highest density of professional endurance athletes, yoga studios, and also kale juice consumption in the world, probably. Now, I have come to spend the day with him at his high performance lab, because we've heard that he's got some great new training insights, specifically the work that he's currently doing on cadence. I don't know for certain, but I have a feeling it's gonna involve some pain, and not just of the green juice variety. Well, that's a bonus. Now, Neil Henderson has been coaching endurance sports athletes for nearly 30 years, from new starters right up to the elite level, the best of the best. Some of the biggest names are Rowan Dennis and Kazia Nuriadoma, to name but two. Now, Neil was also a pro triathlete, but we won't hold that against him. So this is the Sufferfest High Performance Lab. Hello. Hey, Neil. Good to see you again, man. Good how to do? see you. I'm good. How are you? Welcome. Good stuff. Yeah, thanks. This place is cool, isn't it? Uh, you know, we, we're kind of into cycling here. <laughs> it's like the ultimate <laughs> pain cave. Those bikes. Yeah, those both have gone uh, and set world records, eh? Nice. So that's Evelyn Stevens and Rowan Dennis. And Rowan Dennis, yep. Tell me, Neil, I mean, I kind of, I get the feel that this is like a chamber of pain, but what, what do you do here on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, we are uh, really looking at ways to make people faster. Yeah. Um, and so we've got a mix of things where we have our lab. We also then have a fit area. We're actually able to look at the 3D dimensions, how somebody's oh, wow. riding and be able to pull that and, and uh, tweak things and measure and monitor how somebody's riding there. And then we also have a little uh, kind of recovery and waiting area here. So if things go south, we can <laughs> send you over here to, to rest for a little while afterwards. That looks like a seat that's got my name on it now. So we do have one soft, comfortable <laughs> seat here in the entire joint. That's the only one, I guess. And let's go nowhere near that. Yeah, that's uh, for swimming, a swimming ergometer. So we don't have a, a pool in here. Uh, uh, but we do have a swimming erg. We also have a treadmill. We can make you run. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, neither of those actually. You only run when chased. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, and even then, I'll probably just get caught instantly. And but there's, there's bears up in Steepo. <laughs> Didn't anyone tell you? And lions. Oh, hopefully, I have lions my, hopefully I have bears. my bike if I'm going to be chased. But the swim thing, I, I can barely <laughs> operate my arms, let alone actually. All right. Well, we swim. won't put you on there today. Yeah. Maybe cool. in the future we'll bring you back. <laughs> So you're a coach on your own, right, but now also working with the Sufferfest, Chief Science Officer, yep. I believe. How long have you been with those guys? So I uh, started working with the Sufferfest back in 2013. And so I've uh, started to do a lot more with them in the, in the past year, but uh, for several years now, been uh, trying to help people uh, suffer better and more effectively with yeah. purpose. So what kind of things have you actually put into practice? I guess 4DP is probably the, yeah. the big one, right? Yep, in the fall of 2017, we launched the 4DP, uh, four-dimensional power, and that's really about creating and tailoring workouts relative to an individual, not just looking at FTP, which is very important, but also max aerobic power, anaerobic capacity and kind of neuromuscular power, sprint power. And so being able to target all of our workouts using those four dimensions is really, you know, one of the things that we've been doing to step up what happens within the Sufferfest and, and the app and how people train specific to their individual abilities. Yeah, so and where did the idea for that come about then? Is that through what yeah. you've done with elite athletes? Yeah, really. I mean, I can say it goes way back more than 10 years ago. I was uh, working with a uh, young kid, Taylor Finney. He was 18 years old, getting ready for his first Olympic Games in I've, Beijing. I've heard of him. Yeah. Yeah, he's done okay. Um, and so he was training for the individual pursuit, a four minute and change long event and looking at his training data and things like that. And, you know, some of these metrics that are typical training stress score and CT, CTL. I noticed that his CTL was like 60 something at the highest. and, and that was really odd to me 
because the amount of training that he was doing was pretty considerable, but it was not high volume. It was very high intensity specific to the pursuit and that kind of a demand. And so I was sitting there thinking that, well, FTP alone is not really describing the training of somebody who is training maybe only 10 or 12 hours a week, but a very high per percentage of that being at a high intensity. And uh, also post Beijing, then I was working with Sarah Hammer coming back from an injury. She actually fell and she had crashed during the Olympic points race and broke her collarbone. And so I was doing some testing in a laboratory with her, but also then doing a field test so we could assess the progress that she was making again across the sprint power to the aerobic domain because she was getting them ready for the 2012 Olympics. And so we were looking at how we could test everything really from the lab, but out in the field and kind of compare those two things. And so we've kind of put together this doing all those type of power profiling efforts that, that Hunter Allen and Andy Coggin put together, but in one session and doing so five second sprints, five minute effort, 20 minute, one minute effort, all in one session. And really that's kind of the basis of how I started doing things and coaching athletes, you know, at the highest level for cycling and triathlon, and then being able to adapt that into the app and what we do with the Sufferfest for really the, the entire spread of, of people that use our app. That is cool. Has Sarah Hammer ever forgiven you for inventing the uh, 4DP test? <laughs> I don't think anybody ever forgives me. <laughs> <laughs> No. Uh, as you know, there's a little bit of a hashtag out there, right? Uh, everyone hates Sir Neil. Um, yeah. It's very, very uh, common in the Sufferfest world. So I get, I get, get my uh, beatdowns uh, from people nice. uh, in that way. All right, go for it, mate. What's going on? All right, Simon, we have you here in the Sufferfest High Performance Lab to take a look at what's going on with your physiology. We have Matt Casson, who's going to be helping run the test and we're gonna have you do our half Monty test. This is something that we developed a little bit actually in conjunction with the folks from Do The Plan With Dan, and really it's a two-part test. There is a ramp that you're gonna to go to your absolute maximum, so no holding back there. Each minute it's gonna get a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, and you gotta go until you cannot go. Okay. Everyone right. fails this test, that's okay. So that's the first part of the test. Okay. The thing that we're doing different here than you would if you were at home doing this workout. So this is one of our sessions that people can do on their own. We're gonna actually have you hooked up to our metabolic card here. So we're gonna be measuring your oxygen and CO2 levels, how much you're breathing in and out, how much you're extracting from the air to deliver energy from that aerobic system. At the end of your ramp, we're also gonna be mean and poke you and get some blood and look at blood lactate. We're gonna okay. look at lactate at that peak right after that effort, as well as in recovery every couple minutes just to see how the lactate level is dropping in recovery. The second part of the test is submaximal. So that one, you know, you don't have to go as hard. We're gonna have a set target based on the peak heart rate that you hit during the ramp. So it's gonna be about 87% of that. Uh, the second portion though, we're gonna look and you're gonna have a target heart rate. You're gonna shift a little bit and just ride a steady effort for 20 minutes. And it's gonna be, you know, clearly below your threshold, but not necessarily an easy all day ride. The other thing we're gonna do after that is look a little bit at cadence. So we're gonna do some really low cadence and then up to moderate, high, and even some really high cadence. And we're gonna to continue to do that with the metabolic system so we can see what's happening with oxygen consumption as well as energy use. How much of that is coming from carbohydrate? How much is coming from fat? Okay. All right. I'm good. Good, good. You may go ahead and start pedaling. Yep, we're off. If you need anything, just you know, raise your hand, let me know. Uh, we, we won't be able to hear you cry out too much, so you know, make sure you, you uh, give us a visual so we can come to your aid. Um, a special, a safe word. <laughs> oh no, I can't hear it. <laughs> and so it begins. Yeah, it gets more exciting. Right now, it's just, just rolling along. VO2, so this is the oxygen, amount of oxygen that's being used per kilogram of body weight. So right now he's somewhere around 29, 30 mLs per kg per minute. So milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And he's just riding along at this kind of easy effort. We have a lot of other information here. Right here is ventilation rate in terms of liters of air per minute that he's moving. Keep in mind that the air here has the same percentage of oxygen as it does at sea level. We're still at about 20.9% right here as you have at home. It's 
under a lesser pressure though. And that's what kind of the difference with altitude is. So you have to breathe a little bit more overall as a volume to get the same amount of oxygen presented to the lungs every breath. So a little bit of a tempo effort there. A little more work. The average 36 year old probably has a VO2 max of right around 40, 42 ml probably. You're, you're well above that already. Nice work, next minute here. Coming up, 360. Nice work, Simon. Yes, yes. Excellent. Still going up. Come on, dig, 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 dig. Just do what you can do, do what you can do, Simon. Which is more than this, come on, keep pushing, keep pushing. Come on, dig deep, dig deep. There it is, good work, good work. Oh yeah, oh, we're talking. 12.3, good work. Now we'll see how quickly it does or doesn't come down. Pop that off, we'll just go right here. 10.7, so clearing lactate after two minutes from that first one, it's good. Two more minutes here and then you begin the 20 minute sustained effort. Lactate was 6.6 .6 at the start. So nice continued drop and now we see what happens. What would you just rate this effort for you? Just how it feels overall. Five or six. About a five or six. Perfect. Ooh, good one. Three point six. Max the winner of that round. Nice. Good clearance. So from six point six down to three point six. There you go. Thank you. 2.9. Good work in the final five. Survey says 2.8. Oh, man. Yep, that's the <laughs> mental test. It's amazing to see after like a full max test like that, actually being able to sit at reasonable intensity yeah. and then see the results that it's clearing lactate. This round, what we are doing is looking at the impact of cadence for a set power on your body's response, both in breathing rate, in fuel utilization, carbohydrate and fat, and then also heart rate, and we're also gonna do some more sticks uh, for the blood lactate as well. Yeah. We're gonna go from a really low cadence for the first effort, 40 RPM, probably lower than you would typically train at, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. maybe not, uh, depending on the climbs in your area, uh, but we're gonna do four minutes at each of these, so 40 RPM at 250 watt, up to 60, up to 80, up to 100, and the last stage shooting for 120. That one's gonna be revving it pretty high, I know. Power target throughout is gonna be 250 though. So we're keeping a kind of ISO power, but with this broad range of cadence, I'd say when you're ready, mm -hmm. you can go and uh, you're gonna have to get, get a big gear rolling here to get 40 RPM and 250 watts. Might have to drop a little lower, maybe even one gear. Then just slow it down just a touch. 44. Now we're in the range. Well, I'm going to get your lactate in just under one minute. All right. You may now go up to 60 RPM, 50% faster cadence rate. There you go, good work. 0 0.8, dropping, dropping like it's hot. All right, it is time to now go up to 80 RPM, still that 250 watt target. One more minute here. 0 0.7. Continuing to go down. How low can it go? Still 250 power target, 100 revs per minute. 
Very good. Heart rate's almost 10 beats higher than it was at 40 RPM. Coming in on the 100 RPM. Check. Ooh, lactate 1.7. It is time. 120. Let's get some revs. Heart rate 164 versus 148 we saw or so at the 40 RPM. Man, that's, there's a cost of doing business like this. Ain't no free lunch at high RPM. And there it is, good. Nicely done. I assume 120 is not your preferred cadence. If you look on that graph, you see your respiration rate is the yellow on the right side. You know, at the low RPM, you know, just a little bit of an increase. Even at 100, it's a little bit of a bump. At 120, you just skyrocket. It is just boom, not, not good for you from a physiological perspective. Lactate, 3.4 millimoles. You doubled lactate from 1.7 up to 3.4. Again, same power. Cool, right, some dates are crunching to be done, yeah? Yep, yep, so you get a little bit of time to recover and get some fuel in you. Oh, I think I need it after that. Well, we've had a little bit of time uh, for me to recover and for you to crunch the data, Neil. What can we see from those tests? Yep. Uh, we're going to talk about first the half Monty test. Okay. So there was two parts of that. There was a ramp and then a sustained effort. And so with the ramp that you went to your absolute limit, we were looking at power and heart rate for you. We did measure your metabolic data. So your VO2, the amount of oxygen you're taking in and using to produce that energy. And one of the things we have built into the equation within the workout is an actual predicted VO2 max value. Okay. So I'm gonna give you this number to you irrespective of body weight. So this is in liters of oxygen per minute. The predicted uh, from the equation is 4.72 liters of oxygen per minute. Our measured actual value was 4.71. So how do you predict it? It is an equation that we put together for using both the heart rate and your power output okay. during the ramp. So and the fact that heart rate is very unique to an individual, that doesn't actually matter in the grand scheme of things when you're working out. Exactly, so okay. each person has an individual heart rate, where their peak is and where their threshold is, and then we work from that individual's heart rate okay. and what we see. Secondary to that, we also did look at your lactate levels because we wanted to see, you know, your peak lactate was at 12.7 uh, millimoles, and after two minutes of recovery, you were down a little under 10 millimoles. So yeah. that shows that you were recovering a little bit. We then did a second test, right? This yeah. is a 20 minute sustained effort. And with that, we chose a target and set a heart rate limit for you between 158 and 164 beats per minute yeah. and allowed you to shift and hold a given power output then for that whole thing. You did average 267 watts during the 20 minute segment and your lactate from the very start of it through the end was actually decrease. Each five minutes we saw a little bit of a further decrease in your blood lactate. What that indicates is that effort that you sustained is lower or below your lactate threshold power. Let's move on to test number three then, shall we? The yes. cadence one, which I'm really, really intrigued about because actually doing it, I mean, it was, it was clear that although my power stayed exactly the same and it was like well below threshold, like yeah. the way my body was coping with the different cadences was all over the shop, wasn't it? Yeah, so we started you off nice and low, like probably lower than you've sustained as a cadence for a long time. Started you at 40 RPM. Uh, target throughout the entire thing, 250 watts. We then every four minutes notched up another 20 RPM. So 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. What we see then from some of the other values are oxygen costs, so VO2, again, liters per minute. At the lowest RPM, you were down at 2.98 liters per minute. As the biggest extreme, looking at 120 RPM, that VO2 climbed up to 3.57. Wow. That is literally 20% more oxygen cost for the same power output. Okay. We also have 
significant changes in your heart rate then. Uh, you were, I believe, 148 beats per minute at the 40 RPM level, and you were climbing up into the 168 beats per minute. So at face value, you might then say, well, my optimal cadence is down at 40 because I'm more efficient, I'm, you know. Heart rate's lower and oxygen cost is lower. Yeah, and I'm burning less carbohydrate, you know, I'm burning more fat. But clearly that's not. That's not absolutely the whole true. Story. It no. is, again, a piece of thing, and that's true that your heart rate was lower, your VO2 was lower, but the ability to sustain that and the force requirements would be significantly different. Again, we can look at things like the hour record and, and pretty much almost all the records in the past 100 years have been set over 100 RPM. Yeah. Now there's a specific you know, track and velodrome and you're in a fixed gear that you have to start in, but that's kind of the highest human you know, power output that we often see in, in that context. And so a higher cadence to some degree is better, but higher across the board as an absolute is definitely not better. I mean, this is just a, a snapshot. So what is it you're actually working on when it comes to cadence that could potentially have an effect on, on how people are training. Yeah, so we're looking at the data that we have from people doing workouts and some of our test efforts, the, the full frontal test and the half Monty test. And these people that have volunteered to, to submit their data. For, yeah, yep, again, know. using one of our, like our NERTS group, uh, we had several hundred responses of even asking them preferred cadence in addition to then the data that shows what cadence they actually ride at. Right. And so, again, there's a distribution. You know, some people do, do tend to ride at a little bit higher cadence. Some people tend to a little bit lower cadence. Clearly, there's more people kind of in the middle, probably closer to 80 or so than 90. I would say, uh, as a general rule, we started to write a lot of our workouts with, say, closer to 90 as our average cadence. And we are definitely starting to push a little bit on that and say, well, actually, I think we need to take into account where a given individual's preferred and optimal cadence is for power output, and then start to make changes to the workouts relative to that individual value. Okay, so what would that do then to someone actually doing one of the workouts? Obviously yeah. they would, they'd have cadence target based on what is optimal for them. Yep. But then can you go further and use cadence as a way of getting an extra training stimulus? Absolutely, yes. Okay. So for a given effort, just like you saw, um, with same power output going at a much higher cadence, created much more of a cardiovascular strain. So we saw actually also the lactate values uh, significantly higher at the high cadence in addition to your VO2 respiration and heart rate. And then we see a bit more of a muscular load strain when we go down to the lower cadence there. We gave you, again, that biggest extreme, 40 RPM and 120 RPM. Um, but we know from the literature that if we vary that cadence by more than about 15% from your optimal, that there is a change in that metabolic cost on either side going higher or lower. To a certain extent, then, there's your, your preferred cadence, your self-selected cadence but actually you could find out that someone's self-selected cadence wasn't optimal. Is potentially and higher than their optimal is. So actually exactly. remembering so to, to change into an easier gear. Yeah. Okay. So we have both ends of that spectrum that we have to address at times. And is that something that you would be able to extrapolate from the data? That There's a bit of that, yeah. So uh, looking at race results, so that was something with, with Kasha from the early races this spring, I was looking at kind of critical moments in the race and you know certain power band and looking at the cadence. I was like, okay, here's some things and this doesn't, l this seems to be precipitating a point where you have fatigue and then you're not able to match the effort. And so in some intervals, we started to, we're gonna push this value from here up to there. So a higher cadence target than when we do these type of intervals that are kind of more specific to that, that classics. And lo and behold, you look at uh, Amstel and the effort that she makes there, the cadence is higher than some of those prior races that weren't quite as successful. Okay, and when you take yourself out of your comfort zone and you, go, you use a cadence that's not optimal, is that gonna be of benefit? Yeah, there's still a, an impact on you and a training stress, just like almost anything else, if we do the same thing the same way all the time, we don't get a change. And so we have to create some stimulus for change. And again, power output is part of that stimulus, but adding then that added element of cadence and a given power will again create a new stimulus. Okay, so training both too fast and too slow can definitely be a benefit. Yes, yep. Cool.
Cheers, guys. Good luck. Right. I'm off for a cup of tea and a lie down. I'm also going to eat lots of food. One last little gem of information that those guys just gave me was that through my metabolic data, they've worked out that I burn a ridiculous amount of carbohydrate every hour, even at relatively moderate intensities. So uh, fueling is top of my agenda from now on. I've got to say a massive thanks to Neil and Mac and the guys at Sufferfest for helping to make this video happen. If you want to see that video about Lloydie that I talked about at the beginning, then why not click on screen just now and please just give this video a big thumbs up.